on behalf of the UDIA New South Wales Diversity and Inclusion Committee, I'd like to welcome Alison Miram, CEO of Roberts Co, to chat with me today. It's wonderful to have you here as part of the UDIA New South Wales One Thing series. Something that the Diversity and Inclusion Committee tries to do is champion those or put a spotlight on those who do champion the diversity and inclusion movement in the sector. So it's really wonderful to have you and thank you so much for your time. So Alison, you have over 20 years experience in the construction sector and no doubt over your career would have seen a lot of change. What do you think today we can do to really support diversity and inclusion in the construction and development workspace? When I started on site, there was porn in toolboxes, there was porn in lunch sheds, there was graffiti, sexually explicit graffiti everywhere. You know, we've got rid of most of that, but you might still find the odd piece of graffiti, um, but there's no porn on sites. There's no wolf whistles anymore, certainly on large building sites, which is good because that was pretty common. The thing that we have done at Roberts Co is treat DNI as a business initiative. So it's not an HR initiative off to the side. It is absolutely core business and it's owned by me as the CEO. It goes through everything we do and it's not a nice to have, it's not a tack on. It is absolutely core business. There's a lot of research that says that if you have, I think it's over 30% women in your organisation, you produce more profit. Now, if I went to an organisation and said, I have the key for you of how to make more profit, everyone would want to know what it is. It's pretty simple, have a diverse workforce. So at that point in time, it is a business initiative because you do want, everyone does want the best company. Um, yeah. And so this is just about creating the best company we can. So how has diversity and inclusion impacted your career and your work life? Look, early on, I felt it. You know, I was the only girl on site. Uh, it was me and the site secretary on most sites. If I was in a meeting with subcontractors because I started my career on sites, I spent eight years on construction sites. Uh, if I asked a question, they answered to the guy next to me and I'd ask a question and then to the guy next to me. And eventually, if I asked enough questions, I kind of figured, well, she's not that dumb. She knows something. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'd start talking to me. So it was that real challenge of I'm not just a little girl uh, and I am little in stature. So, you know, I always got called that little girl. Initially, you felt like you had to prove what you knew once you got to that point and you became accepted, then it was a very different um, scenario. So I am acutely aware of what I went through to make sure other women don't go through that mm -hmm. and that we've got a better industry for them to come into. I actually had a meeting probably five years ago. We had an incident on one of our projects and I got called down to present to uh, a brigadier in the Defence Forces. And I had the meeting and for half an hour, he asked me a question and he only looked at me for the answer. And because I was the most senior person in the room and defence is, is very hierarchical. Mm. And I walked out and I said to the two guys with me, that was amazing. I have never, ever experienced that in 20 years. And they looked at me and they said, what? What happened? They, they hadn't registered what was going on. But for me, I had never, ever experienced it 20 years in the industry where I was asked the question, it was only me to answer. Um, mm -hmm. It was quite a refreshing situation to be in and it was very respectful from the people that I was being interviewed by. You obviously created a career for yourself and you're in a position of, of seniority and leadership and along the way would have had a lot of leaders influencing you. What's the single biggest lesson you have learned about leadership itself? For me, I have a very um, personal view on leadership that you need to look after your people. You, it's not about um, being the aggressive alpha male to phrase it, to, to coin a phrase. Mm -hmm. um, I care about my people and I genuinely care about them. And um, you know, some people say to me, what's the thing that you're most proud of in your career? And it was when one of our apprentices had a tragic accident at home and, and became quadriplegic and we, we got him back to work. We got him back to work. He was an apprentice. He couldn't be an apprentice anymore. Um, I went and saw him in hospital and the spinal unit in a hospital is the saddest place you will ever go to. Mm. Um, and I said to him, mate, you've got a job. doesn't matter. You've got a job. You just get better. We'll, we'll employ you. And 
we raised a whole lot of money, we fixed his house, um, we created a trust for him and we got him back to work. And you know, that I, I didn't do it for the outcome of what our staff would think. I did it because I genuinely cared about this young man and his family and I couldn't imagine being 25 and having that predicament. What the staff saw was that the company genuinely cared. Mm. The staff turned around and said, oh my God, this is amazing. This company's incredible. They care so much. Um, and so I really care about our people. And if you can look after your people, they're your only asset, really. Um, they they give it back to you in spades. You know, they're incredibly loyal and, and hardworking for you. So just for me, it's just be genuine and care about your people. You've got to be game to be vulnerable. And a lot of people think it's that I can't say I don't know. I say to our staff all the time, I don't know. I need to sleep on it. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what I don't know. And they respect you for that. And, and it makes it okay for them to say, I don't know. Uh, and so you have to be comfortable to be vulnerable. Um, and once you're comfortable in that space, then you can really care for people. In your career, you would have received lots of advice, some solicited, some not so solicited, and some people who no doubt claim they gave you the advice, which may not be accurate. But what is the best piece of advice that you have received? Give you two pieces. One I got very early in my career as I stepped into people management roles and my boss at the time said to me, when someone comes to see you and, and you're their manager, at that point in time, you are the most important person in their life. So stop everything you're doing. Put your phone down, put your keyboard down and give them the time that they need. Now that might extend your working day, but that's your issue as a manager. You need to work out how to manage that but solve the issue for the person at the time. Um, and that has been very, very good advice. Uh, you, and you know what it feels like when you go to your manager and they're still typing or they're still on their phone and you think, oh, why do I bother? Versus when they're fully engaged in what you have asked for advice on. Um, so that's the first one. And that's for when you're stepping into people manager roles and obviously continues throughout your career. The second one um, is choose your attitude. Uh, I have talked about this all over um, you know forever that early on in my career I got into a builder's lift and it said in the graffiti who's got bigger balls than Alison now I could have chosen to take offense to that or I could choose to take it as a compliment and I took it as a compliment they mm. were respecting me they were saying she's tough um, but it was written in in a complimentary tone and I went home and I said to my dad I've made it I, I've been accepted uh, and so when you're in a position when you're in the minority as, as a minority group, as I have been, sometimes people say things that they don't actually mean and they say it and they don't understand what they've said and the consequences of what they've said to you. So you need to decide, did they mean to say it as a criticism or did they say something that they were joking that they didn't really know what they were saying and I'm not going to take it as a criticism? And that's where you choose your attitude. In the diversity and inclusion committee, we have we have a slogan, and it's "What's your one thing?" Yep. Um, and it's something that we ask everyone that we meet, and it's something that we ask ourselves as well, and we we put it on ourselves. And it's really about understanding what impact we choose to make, or we through our companies choose to make to really um, create change in diversity and inclusion in in our workspace. Um, what's your one thing? So um, I probably don't have a one thing, uh, I, I do a lot, but what I am trying to do is change process and procedures so that it's enduring change. Uh, when, when the GBCA brought out their Green Star Standard, I wrote to them and I said, can you, the, the GBCA tool at the moment in the previous version cared about the planet and it really rated the building for the benefit of the building occupants on completion but it didn't look at how we built it and how we treated people through the build process. And so I said, can you start rating when we start building, not when we hand over? And I said to them, can you put in female PPE and female toilets? Because that's one of the big things that women don't feel included when they have to wear male clothes or they don't have a toilet. And they looked at me like I had two heads and we wrote a submission and I got a whole lot of contractors to sign it. And they put it into consultation and a couple of contractors said, oh, that, that's too hard. That'll make building too expensive. You can't get female PPA. 
And they came back to me and they said, you're right, we need to do this. Now it's in the new tool. Um, and so forever, when and, and it's in the tool as a mandatory criteria. So if you, no matter how green your building is, if you don't treat women appropriately during the build process, you will not get a green star rating for that building. Wow. So trying to do that, um, Project 5, where we have worked at Concord Hospital five days a week, um, we did that to try and combat the mental health issues that are in the industry. And we engaged University of New South Wales to study the outcome. We got better work-life balance. And that was what was expected. But what I didn't expect and what has come out is we interviewed next of kin. And they said, by your working hours and your working patterns, women are leaving the workforce to do all the caring responsibilities. And so if you think about that, women are turning down full-time employment. They're not taking promotions because they know they have to do pick up and drop off. We are the third largest industry in the country and by our working patterns, not only are we poor at bringing women into the industry, we are stopping women from working in society in all roles. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're trying to do is change the industry to be five days a week. It wasn't always six days a week and it certainly wasn't seven. Now, if we can change that and I can get systemic change and, and I have been on the cultural task force with government for the last two years and the culture standard has come out into consultation. So I encourage everyone to look at that. It's if you go into www.cultureinconstruction.com.au, you can read the, about the tool. Fantastic. We're pushing five days a week, we're pushing diversity, we're pushing putting the health back in WHS. Um, all of that will bring systemic change for diversity and inclusion. And that's what I'm trying to push for. So when looking at uh, employees in the company I'll say to them go and get a female uh, and they'll say to me very proudly I'll get the best I'll get the best person for the job and I'll say in the female gene pool and when you've exhausted the female gene pool you can go to the male gene pool but try first and every time they come back with an outstanding uh, female where I can I am trying to push really systemic change that at the end of the day when I retire it's there it's forever and it's not no one will have to fight again and and I don't mean you'll never have to fight for anything. Of course you will. But where I can, it's not about me here and now. It's about generations that come behind. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. Your foresight is absolutely incredible, Alison. And and the depth of thinking that you have is very refreshing and, and inspiring. So thank you, thank you so you. much for everything that you do for women in the industry and not just women, but for every person in the industry in so many different ways as you've outlined and, and, and i think that's a really good point to say when what we have discovered in project five is that it's not a female issue it's a people issue mm. we need to actually get dads home so that women can have a career so we actually need to fix the industry for men to get more women into it, it, it yeah. it's, a, it it's a people issue it's not a female issue we will absolutely share your story and, and we're very, very grateful for everything that you do. So thank you. Oh, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure.